Wisconsin this evening. Uh, let's not forget Sunday morning, 11 a.m. church. Amen. Sunday's coming. Uh, fasting, prayer, Bible reading. Make sure we're taking time to get close to God. Uh, let's not forget about our CCC ministry. Um, the uh, Let's not forget Tuesday night's Zoom call with Brother Bond and Sister Bond for our kids and also for the uh, youth on 8.30 on Thursdays. Amen. Um, men, don't forget about the men's conference on August 13th and 14th. Uh, ladies, September 10th and also the first Sunday in August for the ladies' picnic. Amen. And so uh, let's mark our calendars for these things. Let's remember them. Um, I think that's it for um, announcements this evening. Um, a couple prayer requests. Um, this past weekend, Sister Tessa's uh, dad passed away, so let's remember Sister Tessa and the family. Amen. Uh, Brother Raymond Woodward lost his brother, um, so let's remember Brother Raymond Woodward and his family. Um, Artie Miller passed away, so let's remember this family. And also let's remember Brother Eve. He's in need of prayer. Amen. Um, so these, um, you know, these are some of the prayer requests. If you've got additional prayer requests, let's lift them up to God. Amen. He is faithful and he can take care of them for us. Um, let's uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, the one that is the author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We lift you up. God, there is none like you, Jesus. Lord, we pray that you'd reach down, God. Touch us. Be with us, Lord. Lord, we pray you'd touch these needs tonight, Lord God. Lord, every one of them, Lord, those that need comfort, Lord God, those that need healing in the body, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we trust in you for all of this, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, we lift up our pastor and his wife, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we lift up our church. Hallelujah. God, we pray, Lord, you just reach down, God. Grow our church. Save these cities. Mature your people. Bless and increase our finances. Give us a bigger and better building. And Lord, send labors in the field. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we are going to talk about this word called entitled. And the question is, are you entitled? Now, entitlement defined is the belief that one is inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. Today, we're going to talk about what you are entitled to. Now, understand um, that we are bombarded on a daily basis of this entitlement. We see it in the advertising. Like, for example, when I was growing up, McDonald's used to have this advertising slogan that you deserve a break today. And we see it in many businesses. We hear the word entitled to. Now that means we deserve it. We have a right to it. You worked hard all your life. You deserve that new car. You deserve that vacation. I mean, you deserve it. You earned it. And these phrases are at the heart of the entitlement message. Now, its message, you can see it on billboards. You can see it in the movies. You can see it on the internet. You can see it on the radio, on every form of media. There's no getting around it. Now, for us Christians, this sense of entitlement easily crosses over in how we approach our relationship with God, meaning we feel that God has to give us that perfect marriage with no issues, that perfect job with that great pay and benefits, great finances, excellent health, no problems. So some could easily fall into that mentality of entitlement. We come to church, we pay our tithes, we give our offerings, we volunteer, we work hard for the kingdom of God. And because of this, we may feel that we are entitled something from God. Why is this topic of entitlement important to talk about? Well, because this sense of entitlement, it threatens our ability to follow Jesus and to experience the incredible blessing that he has for us. We need to destroy this mentality 
of entitlement because it is a thief and it robs you and it robs God. So hold on. So how about entitlement in the church? For example, I've been going to say somebody has been coming to this church for 30 years and I deserve to sit wherever I want and I deserve it my way. I can't believe someone was actually sitting in my seat. If I don't get my way, I'll stop giving my tithes and offerings and don't ask me to do anything. We'll just go to another church until this pastor uh, just lets down on the standards. Look. The list, it goes on and it goes on. There's no place in the church for a self-serving attitude. Understand, you are not entitled. Before we talk about this topic of entitlement, how it robs us, here is a question. Does God owe us anything? Now, there are some that will say, absolutely not. God doesn't owe us a thing. But on the flip side, there are some that will say, yes, absolutely. I, I mean, God, he created us and he's responsible for us. Now understand that the God that we serve is a God of goodness and he cares about every facet of our existence. This is the God that we serve. It's out of God's goodness. If anyone is obligated to God, it is not God to us, but us to God. Now God in his goodness does does show great care for all that he has created, but this is not because God owes us anything. It's out of his free goodness, and it's not out of an obligation to give us something that is owed, but in fact, Scripture teaches that God created, uh, creating us obligates us to him, not the other way around. In Romans chapter 9, verse 19, Paul writes, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a uh, human being, uh, to talk back to God? Shall uh, what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for some special things and some from some common things? God, as the potter, is not obligated toward the clay. Instead, the clay is obligated toward the potter. Now, let that one sink in. Similarly, Moses' interaction with God in the burning bush passage demonstrates that God is not obligated toward us. In Exodus 4, Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, uh, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. In other words, Moses is saying to God, if you wanted me to go to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh, you should have gave me an eloquent voice. Now, the Lord does not see himself as being obligated to Moses. Instead, he's, he, sa he, he, he says, he, he responds to Moses in the next verse by saying, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or who makes them mute? Who gives them sight and makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Now, God fully acknowledges that he made everyone and he takes responsible for our deficiencies. At the same time, God does not see himself as owing Moses eloquence. He tells Moses just to simply obey me. Amen? God being the creator does not obligate him to us, but us to him. After all, it would be impossible for any of us to be entitled to be created. Every time we breathe, now I want you to listen to this. Every time we breathe, we demonstrated that we owe God. God never promised any of us another breath. God never promised us anything. He never promised us another day. It's all because of God and his goodness. When we have a sense of entitlement, we give a voice to a thief. Our sense of entitlement, it robs God and it robs us. Now, the question is, entitlement, what does entitlement rob you of? Well, it robs God of his generosity. For example, most of us, you know, that work, uh, we complete a tax return. And God willing, we're going to receive a refund. 
Now, I would believe that no one who receives a refund would consider the government generous for at least two reasons. One, when you receive a refund, you are simply receiving back some of the money that you gave the government. They are not being generous since they're giving you back money that is yours in the first place. Number two, you demonstrate that you are owed the money based on tax laws. There is nothing generous about giving someone money they are owed. If there was so, anyone who felt a sense of entitlement, it would be in the story of Job. God says in Job 41 that whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Job, he loses his livelihood. Job, he loses his friends. Job, he, his wife turns against him. Job loses his sons. He loses his daughters. He goes from being one of the very rich men to now wallowing in the dust with sore boils. From what this man went through, you would think that he is entitled to something. But according to God's word, God owes us nothing. He is not obligated to do anything. Why? Because he is God. He's the almighty God. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. He is, I mean, he owns everything. Everything we have in our homes, we are stewards of. We don't own anything. God has just blessed us with all these things because of his goodness. Amen? We best understand that our lives revolve around him, and he is the center of it all, not the other way around. But in spite of who God is, he still gives us what we need and even the things that we desire. That is the nature of the God that we serve, a God who loves us unconditionally. It doesn't make a difference what our past is. God loves us unconditionally. Praise the Lord. Another thing that entitlement robs us of is our gratitude. A gratitude is focusing on what's good in our lives and being thankful for the things that we have. It also means to take notice and appreciate the things that we often take for granted, like the homes that we have, our cars, our jobs, food, clean water, friends, family, and how about the air that we breathe? Entitlement, it robs us of gratitude. And the Apostle Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 1. It says, because knowing God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were thankful. But they became vain in their imaginations, and their, and their foolish heart was darkened. Next verse, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Now here, Paul, he's showing the downward spiral of sin. First, the people reject God. And the next thing, they make up their own ideas of what a God should be and do. Sexual sin is okay. Greed, hatred, envy, murder, fighting, lying, bitterness, gossip, and the entitlement mentality. See, God does not cause a steady spiral downward. When God calls you, it is you that rejects him. Then he allows you to choose. That's one thing about our God. God doesn't make us like puppets. God gives us free choice to make decisions in our life. Some are good, some are bad. But I'm here to say that choose the things of God and you will live eternally. If there is something to be learned from this, it would be to be thankful in all things. In Luke 17, it tells the story of the 10 lepers who were all healed of the leprosy. But only one of them returned to say, thank you. He ran back to Jesus, praising him for his incredible goodness. Now, in Exodus chapter 13, God delivers Israel from Egypt. The miracle of the parting and the crossing of the Red Sea, the destruction of the Egyptian army. If there was ever a scene that would be unforgettable, it would be that scene. I mean, I mean, if you saw a wall of water on the left and the right, just standing up and you're walking on dry land, I'm going to let you know something. That would be ingrained in my mind, and I could never forget that. But guess what? A short time later, the Israelites, they forgot. They're thirsty, and I understand that this is justifiable. I mean, God understands, and God cares all the time. Now, what did the Israelites do? Did they fall on their knees and pray? Did they petition God? Did they seek him first? Did they humble themselves and simply just ask to su supply some water? No, they didn't do this. They decided to complain. They decided to mumble and grumble and whine and moan and blame Moses. Or you might as well say they blamed God in all this. I mean, the Israelites, they were entitled 
They find water. And Moses, he throws a branch in the water and it's pure. When they were hungry, God provided manna and quails. But right afterwards, they complained more. You see, the Israelite are kind of like us. No, we're not complaining about manna and the Israelite army. The mindset may be when our circumstances are good, um, we seek God. But as soon as things seem to go south, we forget him. Being ungrateful not only offends God, but it's also a misery for you. It's a misery and a cancer for others, their families, their friends, their church. And these people are ready to judge and condemn everyone. We're going to be talking about combating entitlement and consequences later on. But for now, thanksgiving stirreth up thankfulness in the heart. Amen? Entitlement. What you are not entitled to. I want you to listen to this, and this may just go against your grain a little bit, but what you're not entitled to is happiness. In our lives, we are fed through the media to do what makes you happy without restraint, without no moral compass. I mean, we have to be happy. Drink as much as you want, do whatever drug you want, engage in immorality. I mean, we have to be happy. This is going to make us happy. Our focus should not be on the things that make us happy. Our focus should be on the things of God. Luke 9 23 says it like this, that if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. And another scripture to dovetail this scripture is in Colossians chapter one. It says that we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And according to Luke 9 and 23, there are three things that we are to learn. We must be willing to deny thyself, take up our cross, and follow him. Nothing less than that. To take up the cross means to deny ourselves of selfish desires, using our money and time our own way, choosing our direction. But following Jesus Christ, it may be a little bit costly now, but I guarantee you, saints of the Most High God, it will be worth it all. Amen? When we make it to heaven, you're, you're going to say, oh, I am so glad, God, I, I, I put you first in everything. Amen? The cross that is talked about is not something The cross that we talk about is not something that is um, not forced on you. The cross that we um, have to lift up is, is, and take is a decision to be a cross bearer by picking up what is difficult that may lead to death. Now, in our society today, sin and immorality is running more free and the abominations in Romans chapter one are now acceptable in our workplaces. If you want to go ahead and look up Romans chapter one, it'll tell you what is an abomination. And our religious freedom is coming under attack. And we will be the ones who society looks as, looked at as haters, intolerant, showing no, no diversity. Now is a time to bear the cross a little much longer because I don't think it's going to be much longer before the rapture of the church. You are not entitled to happiness in a carnal and worldly way. But the Bible says happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Now, if God is the Lord of your life, you will experience true happiness. Amen? You are not entitled to a certain standard of living. Standard of living. Now, that refers to a level of wealth, comfort, material goods, and necessities available. Now, that means it could be a type of a job and income, um, education, now, and so on and so on. Now, just understand, the Bible never said that you are entitled to these things. Now, Paul talked about the need of contentment. Philippians chapter 4 says, not that I speak according to need, for I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In everything and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, the Israelites were not content with what God provided them. And many today are not content with the blessings that they have received from God and even believe that they are entitled to much more. Now, pastor, now he was talking about the things that 
the apostle Paul went through. He was whipped. He was beaten, thrown in prison. He was stoned. Three times he suffered a shipwreck. He was robbed. His own countrymen turned against him. His, the strangers turned against him. He was very weary. He was tired. He endured much pain. He was often hungry. He was often thirsty. He endured the cold many times. On top of that, he had to take care of the church. But in all of this, Paul never made a reference that he was entitled to something. We are not promised a certain standard in the way we live. Now, we can improve uh, things through hard work, and I believe that hard work is essential, not only in the kingdom of God, but even in this world. Proverbs 14 says, in all labor, there is profit. But even if we have the bare minimum, we are still to be content in what we have. Just because your friend bought that expensive item, that doesn't mean that you have to go out and buy it feeling that you need to compete and keep up with. Some people use the phrase keeping up with the Joneses. Understand, you don't know the financial situation of the Joneses. They may have credit card debt up, up to here and you're gonna go ahead and keep up with them and you're gonna be in the same boat with them and you're gonna sink. Another thing we are not entitled to is to marry who we want. We are living in a society that we can marry who or what we want. I, I even read an article. I'll tell you what, this is probably one of the most bizarre things I think I, I've ever heard. I have read an article about a woman who married her dog. Seriously? God instituted marriage from the beginning. After God created Adam, he created Eve. This is the foundation of all marriages. And since this is God's word, we must respect that. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 that he, which made them at the beginning, made them male and female. Just because the media is promoting ungodly lifestyles, it doesn't make it right. There are also people who get married because of physical attractions. And shortly afterward, that dies out and the marriage dies out. And they just casually just get a divorce and start over with somebody else. This is not what God intended. Also, Samson got in trouble because he married someone not of his faith. We are, we are not entitled to marry who we want and what we want. Marry someone who is in the faith and marry someone according to the way God would have it. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And my first pastor used to always say one wife and no sweethearts on the side. That could preach. We are also not entitled to our own interpretation of truth. This is the idea that we all can decide what is wrong and what is right according to the way we feel. Because it feels right, doesn't make it right. There's no standard. You can believe all you want, but that doesn't make it right. It may, may feel right, it may look right, it may seem right, but the Bible says in Proverbs 14 that the end there are, thereof are the ways of death. John 17 says to sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If you are a follower, you become sanctified, meaning you're set apart for God's use. You are cleansed. You are made holy through believing and obeying the word of God. We need to be sanctified. God's word is truth. When people want to argue you about what you believe, they are not coming against you personally. They are coming against the word of God. But woe unto them that come against the child of the most high God. When, things are, uh, when, when the things that they are doing is wrong, we are to love them. If it goes against God's word, we are to love them. When the things that they are doing is ungodly, disgusting, and immoral, we are still to love them and pray for them. And we still stand on our beliefs, but we allow God to take care of the situation and we allow God to judge. Amen? You present yourself as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't have enough truth in you, then this world is going to run circles all around you, rendering you powerless. Get praying, read your Bible, meditate on God's word, and praise and worship. Get into fasting. Get into seeking the throne of God. Humble yourself. Seek him while you can. 
We don't have much time. Now is not the time to play around. Amen? Some of the consequences of entitlement mentality in the church. Uh, here's what it does. Uh, the entitlement mentality in church generates conflicts and church fights. I'm not saying it happens here, but this is just a generality. When church members have an entitlement mentality, they get angry when things uh, just don't go their way. This then leads to conflict and even church fights. Entitlement keeps the focus of the great commission and the great commandment. Now, understand, if you don't know what the great commission is, I'm going to read this to you. From Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 19. It says, Go ye therefore, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, te teaching them all things. Jesus left these last words to his disciples, that they were to make more disciples. And they were to baptize and teach their disciples to obey him, and he would be with them always. That's what our job is. The Great Commission is for us to get out there to teach and, and to um, make them into disciples and let them make other disciples. Amen? So if you call Jesus your Lord, we are to minister wherever we can. This is not an option, but a command from God. And as we obey, we have the comfort that God will be with us even to the very end. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and teach. I'm going to say this again. This is important. Therefore, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And that is in Jesus' name. Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things, not just what you feel like, all things. Whatever I commanded you, that's not even an option. It's a commandment. And behold, I am with you all the days until the end of the world. Amen. And the great commandment is this. Matthew 22, it says that one of them, a lawyer, he asked, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Uh, this is something we really need to listen to. Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This, the first and great commandment, and the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm going to let you know something. There is a lot of love going on here. Amen? Entitlement is self-focused. Now, the great commission and the great commandment are, are uh, other focused. It would be extremely hard to do the great commission with an entitlement mentality. Amen? Entitlement turns giving into dues. Now, the money given to the church is not done so with open hands. It has strings attached. This is the entitlement mentality. And those strings will jerk the money back the moment entitled church members don't get their way. Amen? So listen, right now, this is kind of be like a little stopping point. But I want you to listen to something. Seek God with all your heart. Be thankful for the things you have. And we will have a continued lesson on combating entitlement. I want to say God bless you. And y'all have a, a great night. In Jesus' name.